Welcome to Five Points Blues presentation of Back to the Basics. Everything you wanted to know about Cowboys football, but were too afraid to ask. Here are your hosts, Nikki Harrison and Christy Scales. I mean, the ratings were down this this year, 10-year low. Um, do you think that that the Patriots have something to do with that? People are just tired? I, yeah, I think there's some tired. <laughs> yeah, I think your casual fans, you're like, okay, we get it. Because if you you're looked great. at, yeah, there were so many polls of, you know, who do they think would win? And it was like, Patriots. Like, how can you bet against Tom Brady? And truly, I mean, this is a guy that's done something that nobody else has done in the National Football League. So it is hard to bet against him. But in the same sense, I think... The Rams are still growing their fan base. I mean, they've gone up and down throughout their franchise history, moving away from Los Angeles, upsetting fans then, then moving away from St. Louis and upsetting fans then. And then the past two years, they've struggled with the Chargers and the Rams dynamic right. in Los Angeles itself. Right. But the one thing I will say is that there are so many stats that show now that more younger fans follow players rather than teams. Okay. And they do have the young stars, the rising guys and Todd Gurley, Jared Goff. I mean, everyone loves Aaron Donald, but those names are still getting out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think that was probably due to that a little bit in the ratings. Mm -hmm. But then the boring game, I thought it got more exciting in the fourth quarter when it was it couldn't go either way. Yeah. It really could. What do you think? Uh, I was not bored at all. I, <laughs> no, I, I loved it. Um, That's because, good. That's good to hear because well, I haven't heard that much. Yeah, well, there's an old axiom, uh, truism, defense wins championships. Mm -hmm. And everyone's like, yeah, you know, that's so passe. It's not. Defense still wins championships, and this was evidence of that. For sure. And, and I'm, I know I'm the get-off-my-lawn old lady who likes, you know, old-school football and stuff like that. But, you know, the college game where you've got these 62 to 55, and, and, you know, football, the emphasis and the, the, you know, spread offense and these high scoring games, it's like if I want that, I'll play Madden. I want real football, mm -hmm. hard hitting defense, team oriented football. And that's what you get with the Patriots yeah. and what you got. But, and, and they can win either way. They can either shut you down and win a low scoring affair or they can win a shootout. And that's what makes the Patriots so great. Yeah. And I think football fans in general in America had gotten spoiled during championship weekend because you have your AFC That's championship true. game and your NFC championship game come down to overtime play. Uh, of course, the NFC one was controversial. Mm -hmm. Still so that I think the ratings in New Orleans were... Oh, yeah, they vowed to not watch the game. Yeah. <laughs> the so whole city. It was controversial, <laughs> if you would, in the sports uh, world. But, yeah, I mean, I just think that we got a little bit spoiled. They had the Rams-Chiefs games earlier in the regular season. That was what Christy was talking about, that mm -hmm. glorified shootout, just every time red zone offense. But, I, I mean, it's just Tom Brady. Yeah. You yeah. know? It's, it's amazing. He is just... That amazing. Mm -hmm. Well, so, yeah. What did you guys think of the commercials? I, I only remember a few, but my favorite was the NFL commercial with the NFL legends. I don't even know what that one hundred year anniversary. That's what we were, okay. 2019 will be one hundred seasons. Yeah, one hundred years of the NFL. I love that one. Well, they did what they could do. Is they they have access to every single star who's ever been in the NFL. Mm -hmm. They have the resources and the means by paying these guys and then so many inside jokes were played and that was what connects people to football yes i you agree know? it's, it was, it's, it it's my favorite commercial of all time of all time of all time because as taylor said it, there were so many right. trigger points and you know if you're a longtime fan or new you know yet you, you had derwin james and saquon barkley but then uh there was just a glimpse there were the three guys in kind of the teal jackets well that's a nod to the uh, Miami Dolphins that, you know, that's Zonka and, and guys like that, you know, it's, it's the only undefeated team in NFL that's history. Right, that's so right. when it shows them and they're just kind of nodding, it's like, Oh, that was great. It was so and Franco thoughtful. Harris, the yes. immaculate yes. reception where the ball's about to hit the ground and he picks it up. It's that and the hail Mary are arguably the most famous plays in NFL history. Mm -hmm. I thought it was brilliant. I did and too. Then, 
Sam Gordon was in it. And I don't know if you guys remember yeah. Sam Gordon. She's 15 now. But she had gone viral on social media probably about four or five years ago. Yeah. And she was the young girl who was playing football. And she was juking, guys. I mean, Amazing. this, I clip, this yes. highlight clip uh-huh. of her had gone viral. I think she's still active. I don't know how much further she's been playing. Gotcha. But when she popped up, so I was like, cool. that's Sam Gordon. Granted, it was like teenage Sam compared to when she was little. Yeah. And <laughs> she had done some things at the ESPYs right. before. But they included her, too, because yeah. that's the future. Yeah, that's right. and, and super so, cool. And and I'm glad we're talking about her on Girls and Women in Sports Day. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, she was the one in the red dress at the very end. So the ball has been, you know, it's chaos and people tackling and throwing and catching and fumbling the balls. And so she's the one Richard Sherman says, you know, have the ball, please. And she's like, you want this? You know, you're going to have to take it. Uh-huh. And she jukes them. But um, there were also two other women uh, featured in the NFL 100-year commercial. And that is that at one point while the ball is going, it's near the midpoint of the commercial, and uh, they've thrown a pass, and uh, Odell Beckham Jr. goes to catch it and he falls into the table, and an official signals that it's a catch. And then you hear, first down, well, that's Sarah Thomas. Okay. And she is part of Ron Torbert's crew. He's the he's the referee. She's the down judge on his crew. So that's Ron Torbert giving the signal that it's a catch and Sarah Thomas saying first down. And then there's another point in the commercial where Beth Mowens, who is a ESPN play-by-play announcer, mainly for uh, women's college basketball, but many sports, including uh, – I think it was two years ago or three years ago or two years ago she did the monday night football game on espn cool. uh with rex ryan in the booth as the analyst um beth moens was seated uh in one of them and you can see her in the background on one of those shots so sam gordon sarah thomas and beth moens were featured in the in the program and there was another one do you guys remember this one it was a toyota commercial and it had, I wrote her name, oh, yeah. Tony Harris. And she's the first female to have ever gotten a full scholarship playing football to college. And she goes to Bethany College in Kansas. When I was at New Mexico, I was pretty fortunate. There was a woman named Katie Nida. Mm-hmm. And she was a kicker. And she played for New Mexico. She played for CU Boulder, too. And she she didn't get a full ride scholarship, but she did play college football. That's so cool. Yeah, she's an amazing person. She actually has had some health scares over the past year so. But she's incredible. And I remember just the talks that she had given. She was like, I can kick the ball. I mean, just it's not hard. You, you know, <laughs> the uh, U.S. women's soccer team played here in Frisco at Toyota Stadium, home of FC Dallas, mm-hmm. our major league soccer team. They played here in the fall. Actually, I think it was in December. Yeah. And so uh, they actually practiced here at in the Ford Center here at the Star indoors uh, a couple of different days, maybe three, two, yeah, two for right. sure. And so they um, uh, were out there and kicking field goals and, and stuff. And uh, our, our midfielder, oh, my gosh, I can't believe I just blanked out on her name. <laughs> Alex Morgan? But, uh, not Alex Morgan. She's a forward. But anyway, she was kicking like 40-yard field goals. My goodness. Easily. Wow. Easily. Well, yeah. We need, if we need Carly a backup, Lloyd. backup, huh? Yeah, Carly Lloyd. <laughs> Carly Lloyd. That's awesome. Well, I don't want to get sidetracked because I do have some questions for us. Okay. Okay. This is a long one, so I'm going to read it. This is regard in regards to Sunday's game. Romo, Tony Romo, said that Coach McVay had an interesting tactic towards the end of the game, which was for the offense to not break the huddle before 15 seconds on the play clock. Romo said that by doing this, Belichick would not be able to check the offense and adjust the defense accordingly because the headsets are turned off at that point. Is there a certain time when they can no longer communicate with the players? And this is from Olivia in Frisco. Thank you, Olivia. Yeah, well, uh, there are a lot of rules that go into the radio helmets and who can wear them and who can Mm -hmm. talk in them. So uh, the quarterback... Uh, has a radio receiver in his helmet and he gets the play call. Usually it's from the offensive coordinator, but uh, he has one on offense. One player on defense at a time on the field is allowed to uh, get the calls from the defensive play caller, usually the defensive coordinator. Okay. So okay? just two players. So two play. Yes. One player on offense, one player on defense. Usually it's your, mi- usually it's your linebacker, your middle linebacker, or in the case of the Dallas Cowboys, it's Sean Lee when okay. he's, he plays outside weak side linebacker. Um, but when he's not on the field, then Jalen Smith, 
uh, wears the radio helmet. And if Jalen's not on the field and Sean isn't on the field, then Leighton Vander Esch wears the radio helmet. Okay. So what happens is you only have one person on each side of the ball on the field at a time with the radio helmet, but you have a few radio helmets ready to go because if Sean's out there for the he, on defense, then he's got the radio helmet, mm -hmm. which means that Jalen can't wear. Jalen has two helmets, and Layton has two helmets. Gotcha. One with, one without. Yeah. And so they're stickers. Is there something on the it's helmet? Like a green there, sticker. There, 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 in, uh, there is a, a green sticker on the back of the helmet, right, for the Cowboys. It's right on that blue stripe. But, okay. but all players have a, a – and it's a bright neon green sticker Let's on the back that. of the helmet. Yeah. Okay. And that's that lets the official, the referee, know, okay, this player has the radio helmet on. And if they see more than one green sticker – then that's, that would be a penalty because only one player gotcha. on each side of the ball can wear it at one time. It also helps the players and the equipment manager keep straight who has it. But by rule, up to three players on defense are allowed to have a green sticker helmet, a radio helmet, but they can only, only one of them one of those helmets can be on the field okay. during the game. Yeah, so like when Sean Lee goes down for an injury, mm -hmm. I remember last year it was like Anthony Hitchens had to quickly, you know, be Change like, helmets. okay, I'm the guy now. Change helmets, And this yeah. was, of course, last year when Anthony was still here, and then this year it was more, better prepared. Jay, but yeah. And, and now that. speaking of helmets, with you talking about how, how fast he has to get that other helmet with the um, speakers in it, what are they doing on the sideline? Sometimes you see them okay. like – I don't know what Tweaking. it is. Yes, like what are they doing? Yeah. Well, to the helmet. To the helmet. Well, mm -hmm. sometimes they're fixing it because you okay. have, you know, some yeah. you have some technical that issues. That is a quarterback. And, it, and if too. you look in okay. the helmet, it would be the equivalent. It's like right above the um, ear hole. Okay. In there. Okay. okay. And it fits. Uh, I believe it fits in their normal helmet. But you know, the equipment staff has to work on that. Okay. Now, what happens is um, the play clock is 40 seconds. So mm -hmm. let's say that I hand the ball to you, you get tackled, and as soon as you're tackled, the play clock begins, and we, we have 40 seconds mm -hmm. until we have to snap the ball again. Yes. And it's counting down. That, that clock is, the play clock is uh, counting down. The person on the sideline who is calling in the offensive plays to the quarterback or the defensive play caller calling it into Sean Lee or Jalen or whoever on defense has wow. it, um, you can they they have their headsets on and they have their little belts on and they they click and now I'm calling the play in. Okay. 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 Once that play clock reaches 15 seconds, and this is what Tony Romo was talking about in the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. Once that play cl the play clock reaches 15 seconds, there's a person up in the booth upstairs, a person who works for the league that presses a button and it cancels the communication. Oh. Okay. So, so if I'm, if I'm, um, Dak Prescott and I'm getting the play call, they're talking in, in my helmet until 15 seconds and then it cuts off. So he could be mid sentence. Oh yeah. Half the play <laughs> yeah. cut off. So, so oh, one, one thing, audibles. Yes. One, one, so one, one thing that Sean McVay, okay, wow. and this is what Tony Romo was talking about. Okay. Sean McVay, who was the head coach and the play caller, the offensive wunderkind of, <laughs> of football. Uh, he talks a lot into Jared Goff's helmet, telling him not only what play to call, mm -hmm. the play that Jared Goff repeats to his teammates in the huddle, but he's telling him other things like, okay, look for this or watch for this, or the safety's moving over, the safety's doing this, or watch for the weak side blitz, or, okay. you know, he, he's giving him instructions, you know, uh, as the play is counting down. Got it. And so what would happen is a lot of times, and the Rams did this to the Cowboys, as soon as as soon as they were tackled, they'd get right up on the line of scrimmage and make the Cowboys line up. And they do it real quickly instead of going real slow into the huddle and taking their time wears calling a play. Yeah, it wears you that. out, but it also sh gives McVay and Jerry Goff time to see how the Cowboys are going to line up. This is what they did to him in the divisional round game, the loss uh, by the Cowboys. So that's more time for McVay to talk to Goff mm -hmm. in the helmet. Got it. Okay? Yes. So they go to do this against the Patriots. Yes. Well, guess what? 
they're doing that fast. Well, on the defensive side of the ball, their coaches are telling, are talking to their uh, signal caller, mm-hmm. and he's communicating with his Patriots teammates. Mm-hmm. Okay? So tit for tat, right? right. I mean, they're right. matching them, right? right? And so what Olivia from Frisco, her question involved, you know, they kind of changed things up. They changed up the tempo, how quickly they got to the line of scrimmage and things like that to try and uh, eliminate some of the talk and instructions that were coming in from the sideline. Interesting. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, okay. it does. Yes, it does. Now, she has several questions, <laughs> which are really, really good. Does the design rules or any other discussions come up about the headsets and the speakers during league meetings? Uh, I think this has been the, I'd have to look up the uh, use. It was actually tech SRAM way back in the 1980s, actually as in the, as early as the late 1970s uh, tech SRAM, the hall of famer, the former president, general manager of the Dallas Cowboys that was into having headsets mm-hmm. for wow. use for, for the, uh, play calls to the quarterback so oh yeah this has been this has been going on a long time they experimented with it a year and then it got tabled and then uh it's been that way it used to be only the quarterback wore it okay um but then they added oh gosh it's probably been what 10 years maybe 12 i'd have to research the year Hmm. but um that the defense was allowed to do it so there were many years where only the quarterback only the offense got the benefit of a play call, the defense would have to look to the sideline and the coach is given hand signals of yeah. what to do. I know uh, Livia had a question is, well, what happens if there are technical issues? Mm-hmm. Well, you got to go back to the old way and do it <laughs> off of off of uh, hand signals. That's amazing. That happens a lot in preseason football because yeah. if only three players can have uh, on defense a radio helmet, well, in preseason, they're just rotating yeah, they're so rotating often. guys, and you've mm-hmm. got fourth and fifth stringers in at the end of the game, and you know there aren't enough radio helm. If you can only designate three players, which preseason, same thing, only three on defense uh, can have one available to wear uh, on the field. Then you know they're having to do hand signals and stuff like that. Yeah, I always laugh because the Microsoft services too. Yes. That's involved. You know, back mm-hmm. in the day, you didn't get that opportunity to watch your immediate film and sit there with your coach and see what things were going on when you were sitting on the bench. And I'm sure. Because what were they doing? Like literally printing off photos? I'd say, uh, yeah. Well, what they do is they they <laughs> take like, they take photos and there there's a it's still this way. Okay. It, because some coaches prefer the printouts rather than the Microsoft Surface tablets. Gotcha. It's kind of a generational thing, to be honest. But like Coach Marinelli. Uh, and, and Coach so, Marinelli likes printouts of yeah. everything. <laughs> so, so, so behind the bench, literally, this is this is our guy uh, Fritz and all the guys. They, literally, the there are camera stands upstairs. Yes. One at the fifty yard line, and then one end zone shot. And they take a still shot right before the ball is snapped, and then right as the ball is snapped, right after it. You know, kind of like right before the play, and then right as the play it begins, and every single play and it prints out and there are guys behind the bench that do it, put it together in a wow. book and hand it to the coaches. Wow. That's fast. Yeah. Now the way it used to be before you had little printers that could print out, you're going to think I'm joking, but I'm not <laughs> picture a clothesline. Yeah. Like your grandma or great grandma yeah. had in the backyard and clothespins that you would put oh the tidy whities along the clothesline. Now picture a clothesline running from upstairs at a stadium down behind the bench and picture clothespins and picture a bunch of photos going down clothespins line. Seriously, that's how fast the game has gotten. My goodness. One thing about the Surface tablets, and Mm -hmm. um, the Surface tablets have been around for several years now. Yeah. One of the things that the competition committee – of the NFL has talked about the last two years is, should we allow those surface tablets, which the coaches and players look at on the sideline, right now, it's still only the still shots. It's a still photo, not a video. Okay. Now, they have some really cool things where with your stylus, you can draw, you can you can catalog things, you can put things in a file, and the coaches can pull them up real quickly. But right now, even though it's you are technically able to do videos, the league does not allow a video replay 
on the Surface tablet. Okay. So all they get on that tablet is a still shot right before the play and then right as the play is happening. Same thing as Marinelli and the mm -hmm. uh, coaches who prefer still shots, photos. Got it. Okay. Um, so you would think, well, why don't they allow videos and see the whole play, mm -hmm. right? And then mm -hmm. you can draw and mark it up. And well, even Coach Jason Garrett, who might, you know, is a pretty forward thinking guy. For sure. He, um, it's, they're like, no, no, that's too much of an, an advantage. You know, that takes away all of the work that you put in during the week. You know, let, let's keep it where coaching is coaching and you're not there, you know, looking at that. video tape. I it's kind of an old school, think? it's an old school yeah. versus new school argument. Mm hmm. So, and, and it, I'm sure it will be addressed again this year. I know that there are coaches who absolutely would love to have the video and not just a still shot, but others. It seems like it would take up a lot of time though. Well, you know, it, these plays are only like three to four seconds long. Mm -hmm. you know, I mean, and we get them on social immediately. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. that, that sounds silly and it's such a different like aspect of that. But, I mean, we have the highlights as they're going, too. And to think of that somebody on the sidelines could have them, you know, kind of almost streaming, mm -hmm. it would be pretty quick if they wanted to integrate that. Gotcha. And, and they've actually experimented with it in preseason. Okay. But um, they have not. It's, it's not. It's not. Been a, <laughs> yeah, it's not been adopted for a uh, regular season. But that is some. Actually, a, it sounds kind of weird, but I, I love to broadcast preseason games mm -hmm. because, uh, especially from the perspective of sideline reporter, because there are all sorts of things that are being experimented. Whether it's an eighth official instead of seven on the field, an extra referee, not a ref, but you know, an extra official. Yeah. Member of the officiating crew. Uh, I mean, they experimented, you know, moving the umpire from behind, from next to the linebacker and the defense to behind the uh, quarterback, and it went well. So they kept him there full time. So okay. all of these things that you see experimented a few years later, they're often adopted and become part of part of the uh, just regular part of the NFL. Awesome, very cool. Okay, last question in regards to the helmets: Do they practice? with those helmets that have the speakers in them? Oh, sure. Okay. They, they do. They do. And especially when you have new play callers, mm -hmm. it's really uh, important to practice and have that. But they also practice doing hand signals as well in case there were any uh, technical difficulties. And by the way, if you have a technical difficulty on one sideline, let, let's say we're the Cowboys and Taylor is the Redskins, if something happens with our communication system, oh, yeah, it gets cut out. It, then it, if we don't have it on our side, she can't have it on her side. Ah, well, that, yeah. that happens more frequently with the surfaces, I feel like. Yes. I've seen that a lot recently where they're like, hey. Ours aren't yeah, working. Yeah, ours aren't working. And then they just cut it on the other side, too. Ooh, you yeah. got to be prepared. You got to be ready. Jeez, because you never know when that can happen. And so that's why it's like, well, why do they still do the photo, you know, the print out the photos when, you know, the, those old coaches should adapt to the new ways. It's like <laughs> not everything works the way it is supposed to work, especially Definitely. when you have 93,000 people with all of their technical, you know, you know, uploading mm -hmm. stuff. And, mm -hmm. you know, there there is so well, we're going to have to get Keller McCrary to come in here, the frequency coordinator, and tell some stories oh about some of the crazy things that happen technically during a game. I'll tell you one quick one. We're at uh, we have a game in Seattle. This is several years ago. And there are only so many frequencies, bands, you know, in the air that you can use frequency. There are only so many frequencies available. And the visiting team, we needed frequencies for Seattle. Well, we needed sometimes you borrow them for, you know, it's like the old Texas Stadium uh -huh. was on the same frequency as one of the local tow truck uh, dispatchers. What? So it was it happened a few times where they're trying to do a play call and they're getting uh yeah, there's a stall vehicle no. on the right uh <laughs> shoulder yeah. uh, I fourteen, you know, yeah. stuff like this happens. Well anyway, Keller had to go to the FBI office, uh called the FBI office in Seattle and says, Hey, can we borrow some of your frequencies for six hours on Sunday afternoon? But luckily there were some cowboy fans in that Seattle <laughs> field office that nice. and, uh, <laughs> and so so the frequencies that we were using that day some of them were actually fbi, FBI. frequencies official 
officials. I disavow any knowledge, you know. Wow. Hope I don't get in trouble with the FBI for telling this story. Well, sticking with the Super Bowl, halftime. Maroon 5, Travis Scott, big boy, what were you guys' thoughts? I feel like Christy just looked at me like, this is your area <laughs> now. I know the frequency coordinator's name, but this is you. You did. I, do you like Maroon 5? I do. I like them fine. Yeah. Just there. It ends there. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. oh, I was very, I, I, my favorite part was when Adam Levine showed his tattoos. So that Whoa. was nice. That was did nice. not expect that from Christy, <laughs> but pleasantly surprised. I like Maroon 5. I think they did good. And I think it was a more Atlanta inspired halftime than I thought they would do. I think a lot of. The- so why did they do Maroon 5? Because well, they don't was, have a tie to Atlanta. Well, there they? was so much controversy already so, yeah. as far as who was going to perform and who wasn't. I mean, Maroon 5 was the first performer of the halftime show that didn't have a press conference during the week because they were prepared for it to be extremely controversial and they just didn't want to go there, you know, just keep and, it on the performance. And is that, I, I, don't, I don't think that's what they usually do have a local tie into the city. Um, an artist, but with Atlanta having so I many, think they, they, they used to, nods. they used to before really? the Michael Jackson, before they changed and it became as big an event as the right. game itself for, for casual fans. And I agree. I, I thought it was, was entertaining. I mean, I don't really, I know of course, like you mentioned Diana Ross and the helicopter. And of course we've had Lady Gaga and Prince and you too. I mean, I don't know if you can expect those kind of performances every year you know they tried to they i mean tried. Katy perry tried to and that definitely had no oh, connection to phoenix no connection. <laughs> well, arizona at all what was it the shark that what left that actually shark? it's funny because i was at the Katy perry concert here in dallas last january january 2018 and there were people a lot of her fans come dressed up and there were at least three different left sharks yeah people dressed <laughs> up in shark outfits don't and and the, and the fans they're getting pictures <laughs> with the people he couldn't dressed dance up as left or... shark yeah, yeah, it I was mean, out of sync. Oh they know God. the exposure they're getting right. that day, the artists do. And then if you can be different or unique, it's going to go viral. Mm-hmm. I mean, the one thing from Justin Timberlake's performance last year is that he did, of course, Purple Rain. And it was incredible. Right. But he took that selfie with that little boy, yeah. and then yeah. that one went viral. Yeah. So mm-hmm. this year, I feel like, you know, there was going to be something. People were ready for it. Mm-hmm. I thought it was entertaining. I, I yeah, I it, it was entertaining, but I don't know if it'll go down on the list of the greatest no. halftime performances ever. Agreed. But may I share something really sure. quickly before we run out of time? Because I was um, researching Michael Jackson's halftime show for one of the stories on Five Points Blue, mm-hmm. and so his that was in uh, January of 1993, so the 1992 Cowboys season, Super Bowl 27 in Pasadena. That was the first time that it was really a superstar, and it set the standard for Super Bowl halftimes going forward, and really wow. for entertainment at huge events like that. Yeah. Okay, so why did the NFL go with Michael Jackson and decide we've really got to put something into this. We already have all the viewers. Right. Everybody who's watching TV that day is going to be watching the Super Bowl. Ah, what happened was two years earlier, this upstart network called Fox, which did not have NFL at the time, decided to do counter-programming during halftime of the Super Bowl. You know how we had like the, it was not the Puppy Bowl. Remember how yeah. later there, you know, others since then, other networks have tried to come up with a way to suck people mm-hmm. away at halftime to watch their network, Puppy Bowl or whatever. But Fox, genius, they had a hit show called In Living Color, made the Wayans Brothers famous, mm-hmm. right? Damon oh yeah, Wayans, loved it. All, great show. Jennifer Lopez was one of the Fly Girls. That's right. Okay. We had it on DVD growing up. Yeah. <laughs> So remember what DVDs are. I do. I do. So a couple years before that Cowboys Super Bowl with Michael Jackson, in um, the Fox put an in a special in living color and started it exactly at halftime. Wow! It drew enough viewers that the Super Bowl viewership, the ratings at halftime, dipped. And this before, before the game kicked Michael off Jackson. again, and the league is like, no, 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 we got to do Ooh. something. That's big. You know, in the broadcast yeah. networks, we got to do something. We can't lose viewers during halftime. S- thus, we're going to commit all to it. Michael Jackson, wow. January 1993, and it's just, I, I don't know that it will ever be better than what Michael Jackson <laughs> did, but they endeavor to reach that kind of standard each year. That's really awesome. I did not know that. Yeah, That's actually, I, I didn't know that until I was researching the Michael Jackson deal. Wow. Well, any any other topics, any other questions on Super Bowl? 
practice it. Uh, you know? It's the 2019 season now. It's yeah. Done. Okay. That's right. Well, now that it is over, let's talk a little Cowboys. Um, I know coaching changes are happening around the league. And, and what what's the latest that's going on here at the Cowboys? Well, you guys have already gotten into Kellen Moore? No, we have not. Mm -mm. Officially official. <laughs> yes. Even though we've all known it. Kellen Moore, the offensive coordinator with John Kitten as the quarterback coach. And I wonder, I don't think there will be any other coaching changes yet, okay. do we think? Well, it hadn't been announced yet, but officially. But um, Carlos Polk, who played a year for the Cowboys as a linebacker and a special teamer, is going to come on as a special teams assistant. So he'll work okay. under uh, Keith O'Quinn okay. and alongside Philip Tanner, the former Cowboy running back, who uh, was an assistant special teams coach this year. Um and then uh, Mark Colombo was retained. Uh, uh, his his contract had been up, uh, but uh, he was retained, so he'll uh, remain the Cowboys' offensive line coach. Okay, okay. So, and Chris Richard, he's staying. Yeah, yeah because you know, if anybody, if it's like, oh, is Chris Richard going to be here in 2019? <laughs> Everyone would have said, oh no, he'll have a head coaching gig. But he but almost did. He um, yeah. Actually, yeah, they they everyone was kind of like looking for offense and some of these young guys and mm -hmm. they the final two there were eight coaching vacancies, uh head coaching vacancies this uh off season and uh the final two were filled this week. Mm -hmm. So Zach Taylor, who was the quarterback's coach for the Rams that had worked under Sean McVay, uh was named the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals this week. Okay. And then we mentioned earlier that Brian Flores, the linebacker's coach for the Patriots and their defensive signal caller, uh was uh just named head coach of the Miami Dolphins. So you mentioned that everyone is looking for, what was looking for offense. Well, a, a lot because the you know the the hot thing was Sean McVay, was and everyone's ask. looking for the next Sean okay. McVay. Not every team went that direction, mm -hmm. but the thought was, uh, and it was so funny because I was so I it was looking Taylor Taylor's got me checking Twitter more than I used to, <laughs> but I, I'm look at the the Rams are just getting throttled on Sunday and ultimately held to three points. And right. I'm looking at Twitter and it's like, boy, don't you know the Bengals are real excited about getting the, the uh, Rams quarterbacks coach. Jared Goff looked awful on Sunday, you know? <laughs> I know. It's so know. funny. But, I mean, you said it. Defense still wins championships. And for everyone to, you know, think that Sean McVay is this just ever-present offense god, but – defense won the championships hey, but hey they got there the rams got they did there. get there and they, they and there. they put a but weapon on the cowboys often do you remember the the super bowl opponent the, um you're talking people mainly remember the super bowl winner yeah i think it's when they play again you know how many times <laughs> do we hear well the last time the rams and the patriots played that seemed to be the storyline mm -hmm. i think the opponent is still big in the sense that it is for at least five years Okay. I would say only because the fact is that you're looking at the Patriots. They've been at three consecutive Super Bowls. Yes. They had won four out of the last six years. Was that right? Amazing. Six or seven. Yeah. Yeah. It was, oh, it was just and, so yeah. back to back. And granted, there were times in between those that they did lose. That's right. And then you look at other teams like the Seahawks, who went to two back-to-back -back ones. They win the huge game against the Broncos in New York and then lose against the Patriots in kind of a controversial fashion mm -hmm. again mm -hmm. in uh, 2014. So it's, it's always kind of up and down. I think it's how crazy the game is played out. Gotcha. Yeah. But gotcha. the Rams, that will be huge for them as a franchise that will be big to have been there. Is there only, you think they're only going to get better? You hope. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you know, I think the people that say, oh, they'll be back next year. You don't know. Look at what happened to the Cowboys coming off of Dak and Zeke's rookie year. That's right. Oh, they'll be back. Look That's at the right. Eagles this yeah. year. Yeah, yes. the Eagles, they'll be back. Carson Wentz is going to be healthy. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And never know. they didn't make it back. So. Wow. Yeah, but, you know, like, other than the Bills losing four Super Bowls in a row, the last two of them to the Cowboys, unfortunately, you know, you're either the Super Bowl champion or the lovable loser. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I still think it'd be a crazy experience to go. Yeah. You know? Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's, it's amazing. And to know that you could get there, I'm sure that does wonders for you as a coach in general. You do get that experience. You can't get that experience unless you get that experience. That's and right. And only one team is going to win. 
but everybody gets the experience. Right. Yes. Right. But and, it's and, so and, good if you win. And the stuff <laughs> the stuff I remember from it is it isn't really the game itself. I do remember that that we had James Washington as our on Cowboys Radio as our MVP instead of Emmett Smith for the Super Bowl 28 win cuz he had the fumble return and the intercept, you know, he's the one that turned that second half around for the, okay. the Cowboys when they beat the Bills the second time. Uh, but the other thing that I remember, um, one of my favorite memories with Cowboys was it was Super Bowl twenty eight in Atlanta. It was the Georgia Dome because that's before, way before the Mercedes-Benz Stadium was um, opened. But the national anthem was sung by Natalie Cole. Okay. And she had a gospel yeah. chorus as her backup. And, you know, you talk about the hair on the back of your neck standing up. Beautiful. And maybe it's because, and, and I was the booth producer. I was not on the sideline. I was in the booth along with, uh, next next to Dale Hansen, who was our color analyst at the time. And, you know, you're wearing the headphones, and, of course, you're getting it in stereo. In stereo and I just, I mean, Dale and I were just trying not to cry because it was just so beautiful. You know, you're like... <laughs> Oh, we got a game to broadcast. <laughs> Hold it together. You know, it was That's it was good. amazing. That's what I remember about that game. Well, speaking of the national anthem, I thought Gladys did great. Oh, what did you yeah. guys think? I thought she I did great. She did incredible. It's a hard song to sing. I get it. Is. My yeah. goodness, I wouldn't want that pressure. No way. Uh uh-uh. uh. But your sister's going to be doing She's it. She's going to be doing an FC Dallas game March twenty third. Yeah, I was thinking back to the times I mean when she would first sing national anthems it was at high school basketball games swim meets so awesome. those types of things and she would carry a little pitch pipe you know because it is it's a hard That's song right. because they're up and down notes and the range is a lot different compared to most songs that's why people get frustrated and they're like well they're not singing it traditionally mm-hmm. some singers simply can't right like some musicians they've openly said this is so hard, hard on time. my vocal range that I cannot sing it traditionally. I had to adapt it to my vocal strengths. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, Gladys, I mean, she's incredible. That was an Atlanta tip again, too. Yes. Sure. So, very yeah. cool yep. there. Very good. Yeah, and plus you get the the feedback on the, you know, the speakers in the stadium. I mean, you it you do oh, in rounds. Hear? Yeah, mm-hmm. you can't you can't hear as soon as you finish this oh say can you see you're hearing then, it again and then it, it loops back elaine boozler who is a comedian one of the great female comedians in the history of comedy uh and she also sings and she's a huge new york fan new york mets and she'd close out her comedy stand-up routine with you know i have got invited to sing <laughs> the national anthem at the mets game at shea stadium and so you know, she walks up to the microphone and she starts singing, oh, say, can you see? And as she begins, by the daunt, you hear it, oh, say, can you? And she starts singing rounds with herself. That's why people And she never words. finishes the yeah. song because because she keeps <laughs> going. You know, and oh, the say, rock gets regular. Say, oh, say, can you see? <laughs> <laughs> she kept hilarious. messing up because she hears herself starting it again. Yeah. Well, on that note, our show is done. We're out of time. Thank you, guys. Thank you, you, Taylor. Thank yeah. you. You have to come back. Thank you so yes. much for joining us. So we're done. 2019 just started, though. We're ready. We're ready. Okay. Ready. Yeah. And we want to let everybody know that coming up on Friday, Kelly That's right. Glass, we're going to have a special edition uh, for on uh, Five Points Blue. It's a pre-Oscar uh, show this Friday, with Kelly Finglass. This Friday, this Friday, oh. this Friday. and at so ready. we'll get uh, at eleven thirty, and we w- uh, central, mm-hmm. and we'll get Kelly's predictions and picks for the twenty nineteen Academy Awards. Are you a movie person? I am. I oh, I, li- I like Kelly's analysis of it all. Have you seen? Have you seen? Any? Oh, I've seen you all. S- oh, yeah. okay, seen all of them. Okay, what well, you're invited. The favorite. Okay. Oh, that's that's my favorite. That's, <laughs> Seriously, the favorite seen, is no, my I've favorite. Seen First yeah. Man, Bohemian Rhapsody, Roma, a couple other ones that are all in the highly nominated. Yeah. One. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So it'll be fun. You uh, you're in. invited. Yes. Join us on Friday. Thank you. If you right. appreciate it. Come on. And and you all are invited too. We want to thank Presley for stepping in and producing today. Right. And uh, thank you all for joining us right here for everything you wanted to know about the Cowboys and Super Bowl Fifty Three <laughs> right here on Five Points Blue. This has been a production of Five Points Blue, DallasCowboys.com, and the Dallas Cowboys Football Club. How about this, Cowboys?